in, a, in Jewish culture, there's an interesting idea that there's a correlation between what comes first and what is most important. <clears throat> so when, when the lawyer asks Jesus, what's the first commandment? Well, he doesn't necessarily mean first in time, but he means first in importance. So as we preach through the commands of Jesus, what I thought I would do is take a look at well, what's the first command that Jesus gives in each of the Gospels. Now we did Mark, and the first command that Jesus gives in Mark is to repent and believe. Luke is a little interesting. Look at Luke. The first command that Jesus gives is not what we would expect. It's not a command to people. It's not a command to you and I of what we should do. The first command in Luke is given to demons, to evil spirits. That's really interesting. So that's what we're going to explore today. The scripture is Luke chapter 4, and this is Jesus', Jesus own first command in this gospel. Listen to the word of the Lord. Then he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are? With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. This is the word of the Lord. I'm kind of a rebel. You guys don't look like you fully believe me. I know I may not look like a rebel. But when I was in college, I got in trouble with the law. When I tell people this story, for some reason they end up laughing at me know why. You can, maybe you can tell me after. Yeah, I, I got in big trouble with the law. Well, here's what happened. Um, well, it wasn't really the law. It was campus security. <laughs> <laughs> and my friends and I were studying political science and getting really rowdy because we were listening to the soundtrack of The Lion King. You can't make this stuff up. And singing along. And campus security came up and we got in trouble. But I didn't think we'd done anything wrong, so I wouldn't show him my ID, and I got written up for failure to comply with a university official. You're not impressed, are you? <laughs> not a story that's going to give me any street credit or going to make me feared in prisons. But I like to tell myself that I'm kind of a rebel. I'm anti-authoritarian. Um, I'm a rebel without a cause. I tell myself that story make myself feel better, but I can understand why you laugh. But as I've gotten older, I've, I've changed some of my opinions about authority, about people telling me what to do. And I've come to think that maybe it's not always a bad thing to have authority, to have someone in your life who can command. And, and it's changed how I think about God, too. I begin to think of God's commands as something much more positive. The philosopher Slavoj Žižek tells a kind of parable that will help us get started to think about why it might be good, why you might actually want an authoritative, commanding God. A little boy has to go visit his grandmother on a Sunday afternoon. Now imagine two different fathers, one sort of from the past, the commanding authoritative father. Now that first commanding authoritative father, he, he would say to the little boy, look, I don't care how you feel, you're going to see your grandma. That's just how it is. Get your stuff together, get dressed, and we're going. Doesn't matter how you feel. Now, the second father, the modern father, the more permissive 
father who uses persuasion rather than command, that father would say to the little boy, look, son, your grandma really loves you, and if you didn't come to see her, she would be very sad. Now, I don't want to force you to do it. I only want you to go if you really want to go. Now, Zizek asks this question, he says, which, which form of authority is actually more oppressive? And he says that actually it's the second. In the first case, the father who simply commands and doesn't care how you feel, well, the child, the son, is still allowed internally to not want to go. He's still allowed this sort of place of inner autonomy. He, he has to go, but he doesn't have to like it. He's free internally, though he's bound externally. Now, with the second father, if the child's smart, and, and they are, the child knows that the choice isn't a real choice. With that second permissive, persuasive father, the child is much less free. Not only does the child have to go, not only is the child bound in an external way to do what the father asks, the child's also bound internally. He has to go and he has to like it or feel guilty about it. It's actually the father who uses the traditional commanding authority that is less oppressive. And I think we can apply this to God, and I think this story that Zizek tells is a warning to Christians. And there are many Christians out there who sort of rather have a God who's gentler and more understanding and would rather persuade us gently rather than command us. But maybe that's not the better option. Maybe, maybe it's a better option to have a God who commands with authority the way Jesus does here. The commands of God have a lot going for him in the scripture. It's by a command that God begins to create the world. Let there be light. It's with a command that God sets his people free from Pharaoh. Let my people go. It's with a command that Jesus raises a little girl from the dead and gives her back to her grieving parents. Little girl. Get up. This scripture and scriptures like it show us a God who commands for our good, whose commands are good, whose commands are blessing and life and hope. I don't know if you believe in demons, and it doesn't really matter to me whether you do or don't, but you've all been tormented by evil spirits or evil thoughts. You've all had something hurtful said to you that in your mind you hear over and over again like a tape on repeat. You've had things happen to you in your life that keep coming up in your thoughts and you can't get rid of them. And what would it be like to have a Savior say to those thoughts, those painful memories, be quiet. It's good that our God commands it's a blessing that our God commands. Think of God's commands, especially Jesus here. These commands are weapons against evil. These commands keep evil at bay, and if they're directed externally to evil, to evil spirits, to death, they defeat that evil. And when those commands are directed towards us, they protect us from the evil that's in our hearts. I want to talk a little bit about evil, because this scripture is about Jesus commanding against, commanding to defeat evil. But it raises a bunch of questions. Go to the next slide. This was a dilemma posed by another philosopher thousands of years ago, Epicurus. He posed this dilemma, and no one's really solved it, I don't think. He said... There are three propositions. One, God is good. Two, God's all-powerful. Three, there's evil. Now, of the three, I think you'd agree, actually the third one is the most obvious, requires the least faith. There's evil in this world. Children die of cancer. Children starve. There is evil in the world. Now, we, we insulate ourselves from it. We're pretty safe from it here in America in a lot of ways, but it still touches us. We know that there's evil. So the question becomes, 
given that there's evil, how could God be both good and all-powerful? Now, if God is willing to get rid of evil, but he can't, well, then he's not all-powerful. If God is able, capable to get rid of evil, and he doesn't want to, then there's a way in which he's not totally good. And this is a dilemma that's posed a problem for all believers in a God ever since Epicurus wrote it. And we can get rid of a few answers right away. We can get rid of the free will explanation because there's evil in this world that has nothing to do with free will. In 2004, a tsunami hit Southeast Asia and killed, I think, about 250,000 people. Now, a tsunami is not related to anybody's free will. So we can cross that explanation off. And every other explanation falls into two different traps, eventually. Any explanation that tries to make evil, like the death of a child or the Holocaust, understandable, intelligible, makes sense, ends up sort of justifying that evil, saying, well, that evil is really... You know, it was part of something good, and so it's not as bad as we think. But you can't tell that to someone who just lost a child. Your child's death isn't really evil. It's not that bad. And the other trap these explanations fall into is ultimately making God responsible for evil. Well, God willed it. I don't want to believe in a God who wills the death of a child. The best explanation for evil I've ever heard is, is given by a man who lives right here in Nampa, Tom Ward. It's a book I recommended in the newsletter a few months ago. And Tom Ward's argument is essentially that God is not all-powerful. That because God is love, he is by nature uncontrolling and has to allow evil. And as far as explanations go, that's, that's the best I've ever heard. I've never heard better. Not sure I agree with it but it's brilliant and it's comforting to a lot of people. But here's the problem. The New Testament, the Bible, does not explain evil. It doesn't tell us why it exists or where it came from. The New Testament portrays evil in the way this passage portrays it, as an enemy to be defeated. Evil, death, sin is an enemy of God and God has already begun to defeat it in Jesus Christ. Jesus comes and he commands the evil spirits, be quiet and come out. This command is the beginning of a conquering, a defeat of evil. In other words, the New Testament doesn't bother to explain evil, but it tells us how God is already beginning to defeat and destroy it. Imagine it's December 1941, and Pearl Harbor was just attacked, the Holocaust is going on in Germany, and a leader in this country says, you know what we need to do? We need to get together a bunch of sociologists and historians and scientists to understand why these bad things are happening. It's crazy. He said, that's a waste of time. What we need to do is defeat our enemies. We need to defeat the evil. In my ministry, I've, I've been present at the time of death a lot of times. And sometimes, depending on the circumstances, the doctor will come in after someone has passed and offer the family an autopsy to explain why the person died. Now, sometimes there's reasons why you'd want to do that. There'd be some comfort in the explanation. But in my experience, the family always says no. And that's understandable. Because when someone you love dies, an explanation is not what you need. What you need is the resurrection. An explanation, a justification of something awful that happens like death is not what we need. What we need is a God, not who explains evil, but who delivers us from evil. That's what the scripture paints for us. A God who delivers us from evil. Not a God who explains it or justifies it or helps us understand why. It's a God who defeats evil with his commands. A story I once heard about a warlord. 
This warlord had conquered great expanses of territory. And towards the end of his campaign, he comes to a small village. And when he enters the village, he sees that it's empty. And this, this king, this general, asks his servant, he says, well, where did everybody go? Did they leave because they fear me? And the servant says, yes, yes, general, everyone fears you. This town is empty except for one man, a monk. And the general is a little bit angry that this monk doesn't fear him. He says, bring this monk before me right now. The servant goes and gets him, brings the monk before the general. And the general says, what is wrong with you? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I'm a man who can run you through with a sword and not bat an eye? And the monk replied to the general, don't you know who I am? I am he who can let you run me through with a sword and not bat an eye. When you, in your life, are confronted with evil, whether you believe in demons or whether you have thoughts of pain that torture you or whether you face death, what gives you the courage is that you have a God who commands with authority and who uses those commands to conquer evil. We pray, Lord, deliver us from evil every Sunday. And it's by his commands that Jesus begins to deliver us from evil. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that though evil confuses us, the death of children almost brings us to despair. <coughs> that you, Lord, do not offer explanations, but deliverance. You do not offer us understanding, but you offer to conquer and defeat death, sin, and the devil. Lord, we thank you for your commanding authority, and we pray that you would deliver us from evil. In Jesus' name, amen.